Welcome back friends. Today we will continue Physics Unit 1 IAL October 2020 session. Let us read this question. So in this question we have a, a very basic experiment. We have a spring that is being extended by these masses. So we have a force versus extension graph. Now the question is asking us to state the significance of point K. What is the point K? The point K is basically this point here. So we can understand from our uh, from our observation that this is the point up to which the graph is a straight line. So we, we all know that these graphs have two important points. One is the point up to which the graph is a straight line, the proportionality limit, and another point up to which the graph, the material remains elastic, that is the elastic limit. And we also know that the elastic limit is somewhere just a bit further beyond the proportionality limit. So we can assume that this is the elastic limit and this is the, this is the proportionality limit and this is the elastic limit. So what is the significance of this point? The point is the proportionality limit and its significance is that up to this point the force is directly proportional to the extension. Don't write the answer in this short form, write it in full form. The force directly proportional to the extension. Now it is asking us to explain the significance of point L. So point L is the plastic the elastic point okay so this is the point where the plastic behavior starts so what exactly is this plastic behavior plastic behavior means that the spring does not return to its original position uh, beyond this point l so if you apply a force beyond this point l the spring will not return to its original position the graph for unloading of the spring is also also shown on the axis suggest why the unloading graph has a different gradient to the loading graph so what is the unloading graph? You see, this is the loading graph. The solid line is the loading graph and the dotted line is the unloading graph. So we can understand from our observation that this line has a different gradient from this line. Why does that happen? That happens because the spring constant of the spring has changed while unloading. And we know that the spring constant is the gradient of the force versus extension graph. So as the spring constant has changed, therefore the gradient has also changed. Now, a second student play, repeated the experiment but forgot to subtract the original length of the spring from, the, from his measurements. Sketch on the axis below the shape of the graph you would obtain for the loading of the spring. So if you don't subtract your original length, then you will always have one extra extension for every reading of force. That extra extension will remain even if you don't have any force. So when you don't give any force, there will be a certain length of the, of the spring, right? There will be a certain length of the spring. So that length this length L will be visible here on the graph. Okay, so now what we are doing is we are placing these two springs in parallel, sorry in series and then we are giving the same amount of mass. Now what will happen is now the spring constant will become half. The question is asking us why will it become half? Okay, so let us observe. Since these two springs are in series, Therefore, the force on, the, on both the springs are the same. So, if this is exerting a force of 10 newtons, this spring will face a force of 10 newton, and this spring will also have a force of 10 newton. We know that tension remains constant throughout the series. So, this spring extends by an amount E. This spring also extends by an amount E. So, previously we had only one spring, so our extension was only E. But now we have two springs, so our expansion, extension now is 2V. Now our extension has doubled. Our extension has doubled. Therefore, our k which is equal to f by extension, our k which is equal to f by extension, if the extension doubles, the k will become half. If extension doubles, the k will become half. Now, long story short, we have a boat here which has fired a flare. So the flare has been fired at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. So this angle is 30 degrees. Now the question is asking us to show that the flare was launched at a speed of 60 meter per second. So what information do we have? We have this angle here and we know that the maximum height was 42 meters. So this maximum height was 42 meters. So let us see what formula we can summarize. Um, while summarizing these parameters, you write SUVAT somewhere on a question paper, like this space here. And then you start checking which parameters you know. So S, yes, we know S. U, yes, we know. We don't know U, but we have to find this value U. Therefore, we will use it, our, uh, we will use it in our calculation. 
So our initial velocity, we are considering vertical motion only. So our initial velocity is u sin 30. So th this, is, this is our initial velocity, u. But uh, we want to find out, we, we are working with the vertical, uh, vertical motion. So our vertical initial velocity is u sin 30. So we know rs, we know u, we know that at maximum position our v is equal to 0. So we know v as well. And we always know that for vertical motion, the acceleration due to gravity is minus 9.8 if we have taken the upper side as positive. So, if we know any three values, we can find the third value from the SOVAT. So, let us see which formula we can use using u, b, a, and s. Yes, v squared is equal to u squared plus 2 a s. Since I've already, already written this formula, it is easy for us to identify. But if you can't, can't identify which formula to use, just write these parameters down and automatically the formula will pop into your head. Substituting the values, we can find the value of u. So one assumption that we made in our answer is that the air resistance remains negligible. So this is a momentum question. Before answering the momentum question, identify your m1, u1, m2, u2, v1 and v2 because you are going to be needing these values in your conservation of momentum equation. So, no matter what the scenario of the question is, if you use this basic equation, you can solve almost any questions. So, it is important that we identify m1, m2, u1, u2, v1, v2. So, I am taking the mallet as m1 and the disc as m2. So, m1 and m2. We know their masses. Their masses are given here. And uh, the initial velocity of the mallet is 1.6 and the disc was at rest. So, u2 is equal to 0. So, after the collision, we use the velocity as v and for mallet it is v1 for the disc it is v2 okay now let us see what these values are m1 the mass of the mallet yes 0 0.17 that is m1 and the m2 is 0 0.035 u1 is 1.6 u2 is 0 v1 is 0.3 v2 we don't know that is what we have to find out okay so we know the law of conservation momentum tells us total momentum before and after collision are the same so the total momentum before the collision is the momentum of the mallet plus the momentum of the disc. So m1 u1 plus m2 u2. And the total momentum after the collision is the total momentum of the mallet plus the total the momentum of the disc. So m1 v1 m2 v2. m1.17 u1 1.6 from the diagram m2 is 0.035 u2 is 0. m1 once again 0.17 v1 is 0.3 from the diagram m2 is 0.035 and v2 is v as given in the diagram so inputting all these values you can easily find the value of v 6.3 meter per second don't forget to include your answers in this gap and also don't forget to include the units for your answers so this is not the end of the story we have seen that the disc attains a velocity of 6.3 meter per second. So this is the disc here. It is it is going at a velocity of 6.3 meter per second. Okay. So now the disc has to travel this slope and reach the goal. But unfortunately, the disc does not reach the goal. Read this read this portion here and, and try to understand why. It is because the, there is some friction on that slope. So we want to find what amount of friction, what magnitude of friction is acting on the slope. So the information that we have is the velocity of the disc at the bottom of the ramp is 5 meter per second. So this was wrong, my bad. It is not 6.3. The velocity that we have here was 5 meter per second. So the, so the disc moves up, up the ramp and the work is done by the disc against the frictional force. So the disc moves up a distance of 6.5 centimeters. So the disc moves up a distance of 6.5 centimeters and then it starts moving back down. So actually the disc never really reaches the goal. It uh, reaches a distance of 6.5 centimeters and then it starts moving back because if it had reached the goal, it wouldn't have come back. So it uh, goes a distance of 6.5 and then it starts traveling backwards. Now we have to find what is the frictional force. So we can use the law of conservation of energy the total moment the total kind of, uh, energy before the disc rises is equal to the total energy after the disc rises so this entire kinetic energy that the, that, that the disc had the kinetic energy of the disc was converted into two types of energies some of it was used to work against friction and the remaining was used to gain its height so what is the amount of energy that it had lost the loss the loss in kinetic energy is half mu square minus v square 
the work done against friction is force into distance and the gain in the gravitational potential energy is m g h m means the mass g is the gravitational acceleration and h is the vertical height okay remember h means the vertical height not this distance h means the vertical height that is 6.5 sin 30 centimeters now in putting these values m is 0 0.035 as uh, as per the question our u the disk had a velocity of 5 meter per second as was stated in the question and our v yes at the maximum point it loses all its velocity so v is zero we don't know the value of friction we know that it went up at distance now for the friction you have to use the distance that it had actually traveled Linear, linearly it had traveled along the slope so we know that the actual distance travel was 6.5 centimeters so you have to convert the centimeters into meters that's why i've divided by 100 the mass once again the value of g and the vertical height okay so this is 6.5 sin 30 once again you have to divide by 100 to convert it into meters that will give you a frictional value of 6.56 newtons so this is something that we see in our everyday lives we have two poles and we have a cable that is hanging so this 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 sad face that you see here this curve this is called a sag this this situation this this shape is called a sagging situation so this is one factor that may increase the sag of a cable so we have temperature and we have the tension okay so other than these two factors what is the further factor yes the weight of the cable the more the weight the more the sag now a cable of mass m is at an angle of theta to the horizontal so as we can see in the question the cable of mass m is hanging at um, an angle of theta to the horizontal now explain why the tension in the cable decreases as the sag increases so as the sag increases okay first let us uh, make this equation how did i make this equation you see this cable has a mass of m so its weight is mg now if you assume that these are straight lines if you assume that these are straight lines then uh, th there is there is this theta so the angle theta this is also theta and this is also theta if there is a tension of t here and a tension of t here so the vertical component of this tension will be t sin theta and the vertical component of this tension will be a further t sin theta so as we can see from the vertical equilibrium that mg is equal to t sin theta plus t sin theta or mg is equal to 2 t sin theta now as the sag increases the value of theta will increase and as the value of theta increases sin theta will increase if you make t the subject you can see that if sin theta increases the value of t will decrease so using this equation we have to prove that as theta increases or the sag increases the value of tension will decrease Now we have a strand, we, we, we have a piece of a cable that is made of both steel and aluminum. Show that the Young modulus of the steel is about this much. So we know that uh, from the stress strain graph, the linear, the gradient of the linear portion of the graph will give us the Young's modulus. So the gradient of the linear part that is within the proportionality limit, as I have read from my part of the graph, that is 200 megapascal divided by 0.00. .00 I have read from my graph, so uh, this value might change depending on uh, your observations, but the value will be somewhere near 1.5 times 10 to the power 11 pascals. It has told us, uh, the question has asked us to show that it is near 2, so 1.5, it will round, round off to 2, so we have shown it. Now, the pylons are positioned every 2 centimeters, okay? So, the pylons that we had, those, those, those poles, those are distant distanced at 270 meters so uh, we have to show that the stress is about 70 megapascal we know that stress is force by area okay so we need force and we need area so the force we don't know the force yet but we know the force per meter and we know the total length so we can multiply the length by the force per meter to find the total amount of force that is 270 times 0.62 the area that is given in the question so no uh, nothing to worry about and we will now input the value of f and a to find the value of sigma the stress and uh, yes it rounds off to 70 so we have shown now the thing is why are we using two types of metals you can pause the video and read this question 
I'll summarize it for you. The question is asking basically why we are using two types of cables. For one of the cables, that is for the aluminum cable, the extension is 0 0.95 meters, okay, at, at this amount of stress. So from my graph, I have read that when the stress is 70 megapascals, when the stress is 70 megapascals, the extension for steel, the extension for steel is 0 0.0005, I've read from my graph, that when the stress is 70, the aluminum strain is 0 0.0005. So using this strain and multiplying this strain by the total length of the cable, I can find the total extension in the aluminum. This is the extension in the aluminum. So we have identified that this, uh, 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 sorry, this is not the, uh, the extension in the aluminum, this is the extension in steel. This is the extension in aluminum. Aluminum extends by 0.95 and from the graph I have found that the strain in steel is 0 0.005 and the strain and the extension in steel is 0 0.14. Comparing this value, 0.14 for steel and 0.95 for aluminum, if we combine these two, we will get a strain, we will get an extension of somewhere between 0 0.14 and 0 0.95. That is exactly the purpose of using two types of metals so that we can reduce our strain. We can reduce our extension. What will happen if the extension is too much? If the extension is too high, then the cable might touch the ground or it might even touch some person. Then we might get an electric shock. That is why it is always advisable to keep the strain as low as possible. With that, we are done with Physics Unit 1, IL, October 20. If you have any other papers that you want me to solve, please let me know. And uh, to get a notification when I, when I upload your paper, press the bell icon subscribe and then press the bell icon and comment watch paper you want next thank you for watching